Thank you so much. It is just a privilege, a joy, um, a pleasure uh, to be with the congregation here at Bethel today. Um, it's 99 was a long time ago. That was 25 years. Um, I, I did that math this morning just to make sure I was right, but um, what a joy to be here. Um, so thank you. Thanks for having us today. Uh, thank you for letting us be a part of your congregation on this Lord's Day. Really enjoyed a few minutes with the Russian congregation next door and also here with you during this service and then lunch and then the service in the afternoon. Thank you also for your uh, really generous, generous partnership with GFA, with GFA missionaries. Over many years, you've supported a number and still do of GFA missionaries. We're very thankful for that, for your partnership with many that are serving around the world, uh, both with GFA and with other boards as well. We're grateful for your efforts to get the gospel to the nations. Uh, so thank you. And again, as Pastor Bickle mentioned, it, it really is, it's very special for me to be here. Um, it's a marker of um, how faithfully and kindly uh, Jesus Christ has shepherded me. Um, you know, 99, I was, I don't want to say this, I was 19. Um, I was probably not at the top of the class in maturity or experience um, when I came here for the summer in 1999, but this church and especially the Bickles poured themselves into me. Um, and served as mentors and teachers. And the Lord used that summer really tremendously in my life. And so being here today really is special. It's a marker. It's a reminder of how faithful God is uh, to shepherd his people. How he has shaped and cared for me and directed me and taught me over the course of my life. And I'm very, very thankful for Pastor Bickle and his influence and example as one of God's really sweet instruments in my life. Um, so today's special for me, and I'm grateful to be able to preach God's word here, uh, share a little bit later about GFA and some of what God is doing around the world. I've chosen a text this morning that will really enable us to reflect together on the glorious message that we proclaim. And we read this text together a few minutes ago at 1 Timothy chapter 1. You can turn back there, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to examine together two verses here in this chapter. And as the Spirit of God teaches us and applies these words to our hearts, He's, he's going to do a couple of things for us. As we examine the message that we proclaim, one of the things that God does for us is, is He helps us understand the message better so that we can actually be more effective with His help, by His grace, in sharing that message with others. Uh, he's going to teach us. He's going to give us understanding so that we can continue to proclaim the gospel to other people. But he's going to do a second thing. And this is my burden, because I know this is what I need. I need this constantly. God will use this text that we're going to examine now to stir our love for our Savior. That's what I need more than anything else. It is true. I can get knowledge from books. I can get understanding from, from, from just studying. A lost person can do that. But God alone can work in my heart. God alone can stir my spirit. God alone, His Spirit alone can actually grip my heart with the reality, the truth of the message that he has put into our hands to proclaim. He alone can actually grip us with it so that our hearts are stirred and driven and compelled to proclaim this message to others. That's what I want him to do this morning. And he will do that through this text. The reality is that our passion for the spread of the gospel right here in this community, in the communities where you live, and even all around this world, our, our passion for the spread of the gospel 
always reflects our passion for the Savior himself. It will our, our passion for the spread of the gospel will never go beyond our passion for Christ himself. And so what I want God to do through the text that we're going to look at right now, I want him to teach us, but I want him to stir us. I I, I want him to to grip our hearts with love for Jesus Christ so that, that we are actually compelled, driven to speak of him to others. So let's read again in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's read together verses 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When we truly boast in Jesus Christ, when we truly boast in what he has done for us, our hearts will burn with passion for his dear cause, and we will long to do whatever he wants us to do for the increase of his kingdom. When our hearts burn with passion for Jesus Christ, our our hearts will actually grieve at the same time because we look around our city and we look around our world and Jesus Christ is not known and loved and cherished as he deserves to be. It it breaks our hearts because we love him. We know how wonderful he is. We've gotten a taste of his sweetness and his glory and his salvation. And and we, we know that he deserves to be known and cherished by all. And we look around this poor world and they don't know him. And they don't give to him the place that he deserves and our hearts break. We long to see others love him and adore him like we do. So let's look at this text now under five points, and we'll just really walk through the phrases of this text in a very simple way. But again, our, 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 our desire is that God would teach us and stir us with love for Jesus Christ as we examine these words about the wonderful message that we proclaim. Look first with me at the certainty of the gospel, the certainty of the gospel. The, the verse begins like this, this is a Faithful saying. That word faithful speaks of something firm, something solid, something that doesn't shake and move. It's it's reliable. You can actually depend on it. And here is a message. God begins these words like this. Here is a message that is as firm and immovable as the very throne of God in heaven. This is a certain, sure, unshakable, immovable truth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You can stake your life, you can stake your eternity on that simple truth because it's not going anywhere. It's a faithful saying. Truth and certainty are not very common, not very popular in the world today, right? I rode the Long Island Railroad just yesterday, and the clerk that was selling us our tickets tried to get me to lie about my daughter's age so she could get a cheaper ticket. And I, I she, she said, she's, she's 11, right? And I said, no, I said she was 12. She said, she, but today she's 11, right? And I said, no, she's 12. <laughs> And that we're just surrounded. We're we're surrounded by by lies. But here's here's something here's something that is absolutely certain. And again, you you can you can stake your life and your eternity on these simple words: Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
when we talk with people, there are so many who who talk of the Bible as as filled with contradictions and they talk about discrepancies. But it, isn't it amazing and isn't it wonderful that they've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and they still haven't found one? There are people who have given their whole lives to discrediting the word of God, to finding discrepancies, to finding contradictions. And after hundreds of years of practice, no one has ever come up with one. Why is that? Because it's all true. From start to finish, it's true. And we should accept this word from God as firm, as dependable, as reliable, as unshakable as his throne established in heaven. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And millions of people around this world, millions of people have entrusted their souls, their lives, their eternity, their all into the hands of Jesus Christ. And he has never let one down. And he won't let you down. He has never failed one who has come to him trusting in him, trusting in the truth of these words, because this is a firm, certain word. And you can go to Jesus, you can look to Jesus, you can trust in Jesus, and he will save you. That's the certainty of the gospel. It's a faithful saying. But look, secondly, at the beauty of the gospel. It's worthy, the text says, worthy of all acceptation. A message so wonderful, so glorious, deserves to be accepted, is what the text says. And this is a beautiful message, right? It's not just a theological message to be contemplated and understood. It is that, but that's not all it is. It's not just something to be compared with the teachings of other religions in the world. No, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, came into this world not to help His friends, to save his enemies. And there are some wonderful stories in the world of literature, right? God has given us some wonderful, wonderful stories. There are actually true stories in history that, that captivate the heart. And, and, and even after centuries, we're still telling these stories from history because they're such wonderful stories. But none can compare with this. The eternal Son of God, Christ Jesus, came into this world to save sinners. It's the greatest, the greatest message. I love the words of Charles Spurgeon preaching once on Ephesians 1. He said these words, When princes wed with beggars, the world wonders. That happens sometimes, right? When princes Wed with beggars. It makes the international news. Right? But oh, that God should set his love upon sinful men and women in Christ. This is the wonder of wonders. There's nothing like this message. What a glorious, glorious message that we proclaim. This beautiful message that it deserves to be accepted by all. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We sing about this, right? When in scenes of glory, I sing a new, new song. Even when we're in heaven, even when we're in the presence of Christ himself, we sing a new, new song. And the hymn goes on and says, it's not actually going to be a new, new, new song. It's going to be the same old story that I have loved so long. We sing, when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. It's worthy, worthy of all acceptation. Doesn't the certainty of the gospel stir your heart? Doesn't the beauty of the gospel stir your heart? Don't you long to proclaim such a certain, sure, precious Wonderful message to people who do not know him. Doesn't it stir us? 
with love for him and desire to make him known. Consider thirdly, in verse 15, the heart of the gospel. Here's the very core that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Just nine words in English. The very heart of the gospel. Christianity, Christian doctrine has some truths that are so deep, they're so profound, that we're still trying to figure out the best way to express them. But here's a message so simple, and at the same time so profound, so succinct, just nine words in English but infinitely glorious, the very heart of the gospel. Just consider these words, Christ Jesus. Not my family. Not my baptism. Not my church. Not my works. Not my sacrifices. Not a whole mountain of sacrifices. Not all the worlds in all the galaxies of this vast universe. It's Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. The text says he came into the world. That means he already existed, right? He has always been. He is the eternal God, the creator of all things. He received for eternity. He he enjoyed intimate communion with the Father and with the Spirit. He received in heaven before coming to this world the worship of angels. Yet he came into this world to identify with sinners like you and me. He knew that he would be rejected. He knew that he would suffer. He knew that he would suffer hunger. He knew that he would suffer thirst. I think about the marvel of that. He, with the very word of his mouth, spread out all the rivers in this world. And yet he comes to this world and he's thirsty. He knew that he would take upon himself the sins of the world. He knew that he would bear our guilt and suffer our condemnation. He knew all of those things, yet he came into this world. Makes me think of another hymn that we don't sing as much. Oh, glorious love of Christ, my Lord divine, that made him stoop to save a soul like mine. He came into this world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, he is, he is worthy of your devotion and adoration for all of eternity because he came into this world. And today, even as I'm preaching, we, we can worship him from our hearts and pour out to Christ our love and our adoration and our gratitude and declare to him from our hearts that we love him because he came into this world. He came into this world, the text says this, he came into this world to save. Not just to teach, not just to leave a good example of how we ought to live. We needed so much more than that. (laughs) And he came into this world to save. And how, how did he do that? Well, Think of all of the barriers between my soul and a holy God. And Jesus tumbled down every one of them. I had a debt, the debt of my sin, a debt that even through the ages of eternity, I would never be able to pay. Even if I had all the ages of all eternity, I would never be able to pay off the debt of my sin. But Jesus came into this world to save. He came into this world and he paid it all. Okay, Remember his cry? It is finished. Every cent paid. I owe nothing more. 
I owe nothing more but to come to him. I was guilty. Guilty enough to be condemned to hell for all of eternity. But he, he took my sins and my sorrows and he made them his very own. And he took the guilt of my sin upon himself and went to the cross and suffered under the judgment of God that I deserve to suffer. He gives me his perfect innocence as my possession before God forever. I was filthy, spiritually contaminated with deep stains of sin. The kinds of stains that, again, no work of mine could remove. No religious work could undo. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses me from all sins. Leaves me whiter than snow. Leaves me clean. I was a slave of sin. I was a slave of the devil. But Jesus gave his life a ransom to break the chains of sin. He is my redeemer. I was dead in my sins, but Jesus gave me life through his death and resurrection. Jesus saves. He saves by providing for us everything that God requires of us. I love that statement. That is that is the message of salvation. Everything that God requires of me, Jesus has provided. And you don't have you don't have to go to a certain you don't have to go to a certain human priest. You don't have to do a certain number of works. You don't have to say a certain number of prayers. You don't have to take a pilgrimage to a certain place because everything that God requires of me, Jesus has provided. You just have to go to Jesus and trust in Jesus. And Jesus saves. And it says that he came to save sinners. Might be my favorite word in the verse. <laughs> Not good people. Not religious people, not people from this church or that church or this nation or that nation. He came to save sinners. And you and I, we're, we're, we're all different in a lot of different ways, right? But here's something we all have in common. We're sinners. And Jesus came to save sinners. There is a, an eternity of hope in those words. You don't, all you have to do, I think Spurgeon said it this way as well, all you have to do to qualify is be a sinner. And I am. And I'm so glad that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. I don't have to be of a certain class or country or economic status. I just have to be a sinner. Glory to God, I am. I'm in that class that Jesus came to save. And you are too. Brothers and sisters, doesn't this stir you to proclaim the gospel? Doesn't this stir you to cling to Christ in love and adoration? What, what a joy to proclaim a message like this. I, I, I sometimes wonder... It's got to be such a cause for despair to, to be in a false religion where we're trying to convert people by giving them a, an, an, an endless list of things that they have to do. And then maybe, hopefully, God will accept them. What a joy to walk up to someone on the street I've never seen before. What a joy to go to my loved one or my neighbor or to cross the world to another country. What a joy to be able to walk up to people and say, all that God requires of you is found in Jesus Christ. Consider fourthly the power of the gospel. Look at verse 15 again and verse 16. Of whom... I am chief, Paul says. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first 
Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Most of you know the story of Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul. How he made it his ambition to stamp out the name of Jesus Christ. He made it his ambition to actually bring the followers of Christ to be bound and to be imprisoned. His, his goal was to stamp out Christianity. He was a persecutor. He compelled people to blaspheme. He hated the church and wanted to destroy it. He did all that he could against Jesus and his people and his cause. His fervor, his passion was to persecute and destroy. But here's the power of the gospel. Even that man found mercy in Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. There's no power like it. There's no power like the power of Christ to save. And a powerful army, a powerful army can bring a nation down, right? Military might can subdue enemies. But military might can subdue enemies and it leaves those enemies enemies. Right? Those, those people that were conquered, that they actually hate their conquerors and would do anything to get rid of them. Well, that's not power. <laughs> that's so limited. Here's the power of Christ. He can turn enemies into friends. He can turn persecutors into preachers. He can turn blasphemers into worshipers. He can turn those who tried to stamp out Christianity into their, into their greatest propagators. That's the power of the gospel. And even today, there are people who think themselves too sinful to be saved. They protest that they have done too much. They have sinned too greatly that the stains on their souls are too deep to be washed out. Maybe, maybe that's your case here today. Maybe you have a loved one. And that, that's, actually, that's actually what you think sometimes about your loved one, about some contact that you have. But, but look, Paul says, I am just a pattern. I'm the chief, but I'm a pattern. What does that mean? Oh, he, Paul is saying if, if, if he could do this for the pattern, he could do it for anyone. And the church in Corinth was filled with people who had been sinners, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Paul wrote to that church, and such were some of you, but you were washed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Doesn't that stir you? <laughs> Doesn't that stir you with joy and hope to go proclaim the gospel, continue preaching Christ? Because he's mighty to save. And then finally... Look at the end of verse 16, at the acceptance of the gospel. I love these words. A pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. How does a person come to experience all of these blessings that are found in Christ Jesus alone? How does a sinner come to partake of this forgiveness, of this cleansing? Of How does a sinner receive this new life, receive pardon for his sins? How is a sinner redeemed from his bondage and, and cleansed? Well, Paul says this, it's actually by believing in Jesus Christ. It, it's by personally trusting in Jesus Christ. That is how people come to receive everlasting life. I want to ask you again, doesn't that stir you? Don't you want to preach that gospel you don't say to people, well, here are four spiritual laws. You do your best. You do your best to follow these four spiritual laws. 
and then we'll see how things go. <laughs> you, you don't go to people and say, here are five pillars. You, you, you follow these five pillars or seven sacraments. You go to people and say, no, no, no. It's not by keeping all these things and performing all these rituals and doing all these works and hoping for the best. No, no, no. Look to Jesus. Trust in him alone and you will have life everlasting. What a message. What a glorious Savior. This is the message we proclaim. Glorious, glorious message. As we finish this morning, I want to give some brief applications to us. I was here for a summer 25 years ago. Uh, but there are a lot of people here that I've never met before. And and you might be here this morning. It might be your first time ever in one of the in a service of this church. I don't know. It may be that you've actually been here for years and years, but but you're actually outside of Christ still. And you know that you are. Perhaps you've you 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 grew up here or you've had a lot of time here and you've you've gone through the motions and you've put on the front but you know that you are outside of Christ. Dear friend, this message, this text could not be any clearer for you. You will stand before God someday, either in Christ or outside of Christ. And this, this text calls on you to come to Him to trust in Him, and it will be for you the start, the beginning of everlasting life. And if you are here outside of Jesus Christ, I urge you, I, I plead with you to turn today, turn right now, turn before I'm done, turn to Jesus, and trust in Him alone because he came into this world to save sinners. That's a faithful saying. You can stake your everything on it. And you would find exactly what it says. It's worthy of all acceptation. If you would accept it, you would find that is, that is true. You would find in Christ a sweetness that goes so far beyond anything else you have experienced in this world. You would find that for all of the years of your life that you have rejected Christ, you have been settling for an inferior joy. You, perhaps you've rejected Christ because you, that you, you, you think you're going to miss out on certain things. Friend, you're missing out now. You're settling for an inferior joy. And if you would come to Christ today, you would find in Him joy. Here's the way the Bible puts it. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. That would be yours today. If you would come to Christ Jesus. But I've preached this text today primarily to believers. Because it fills us with hope. And it stirs our hearts to give ourselves to Christ and His cause. This is such a motivating text for us. You are surrounded with multitudes of people who need to hear this message. And, and Christ, Christ is the head of the body, right? He's the head of the church. He has actually placed you in this part of His body. He's placed you here on purpose because he has a role for you to play in this body as this church seeks to reach out in this community. And what, what a motivating text here that we have examined today that you could proclaim this glorious message right here and God would use it to save sinners, the sinners for whom Jesus died. But finally, this morning, could we think for a moment 
of those places all around this world where Jesus is not known, places that still lie in absolute darkness. Is there darkness in Sheepshead Bay? Absolutely. Darkness in Brooklyn and New York City? Absolutely. Is there darkness in the United States? Absolutely. There, but there are places in this world that still lie in absolute darkness. Okay, there's not nearly enough, but there is some light here. There are places in this world with no light. Dear brother or sister, dear young person, You could go to a place like that, filled with hope, because of this text that we've looked at this morning. You could go and proclaim this glorious message, knowing that God would save people through Jesus Christ, through your proclamation. What a joy that would be for someone from Bethel Baptist Fellowship in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, to leave this place. And go to one of the dark, dark, dark places in this world to proclaim this certain beautiful message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it would be for you a joy, a joy, a delight to your soul and for the glory of God's name. Would you, would you consider that? Maybe you would seek that. And God would, God would faithfully direct you. For his namesake.